Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Edinburgh uh, March edition. Uh, we've got some lovely speakers for you tonight. Quick thank you to the sponsors uh, from the Art Consortium, Jumping Rivers and Red Hat uh, that help us get this thing off the ground. Uh, and with that, next up we have Elliot Meader, and he's going to be talking about styling. Uh, do you want to get your screen sharing up and running? Sure. Okay, you guys see things. my uh, that's see everything? That's looking lovely. Yep, that's looking like your browser. All right, well, I shall be quiet then. Great. Take it away. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me back. Um, this is actually my third time, third time, I think, presenting um, at Edinburgh R Users Group. Uh, I'd always have a great time. I do wish we could go to the pub afterwards, um, but I won't uh, harp on it because I know we're all probably missing it. Uh, anyway, it's good to see some uh, familiar faces. Um, I wanted to talk to uh, Mike asked me to do this. Um, uh, when Mike asked me to do this, uh, he he asked what I wanted to speak about. Um, normally, I would speak about network analysis because that's sort of my area of expertise is quantitative social network analysis, and that's what I, what I spoke on the last two uh, times I was here. But something's happened since then, and uh, I'm changed, and I felt that it was imperative that I speak to you about CSSS and HTML, um, which is not R. Uh, but it is used, obviously, for styling um, in our interactive outputs a lot of times. So that's what I'm here to talk to you about. Um, and my 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 title is, does it have to look like a 90s website? And that's important. Um, and you'll find out in a little bit why that is important. But first, about myself. So I work at the Rural Policy Center at SRUC, um, which is Scotland's rural college. It's a... I guess it's a small sort of semi-research college, semi-consultancy that uh, focuses specifically on agriculture and rural uh, societies and economies in Scotland. Um, I've been coding in R for about four years now, um, which is uh, consequently the same amount of time I've known Mike Spencer. Um, uh, I have a blog where I code in R related specifically to social network analysis and um, and development. Uh, sustainable development. Uh, like a lot of us, perhaps, I've started making uh, dashboards and shiny apps in the last year and um, really enjoying that and see it as a, as, you know, a, a good medium for uh, conveying a lot of the uh, complex statistical findings that we, our users, tend to, to find. Um, but I need to preface the rest of this talk with the, uh, with number five here. I'm not a web developer. I'm just an R user okay um but i feel that it's important for us all to have a good understanding of some of the concepts behind front-end web development um so that we can incorporate those if we need to um within our our uh shiny apps or with our our markdown html documents um or or whatever it may be um so what prompted this talk um so a while back this summer um, and don't tweet this part if you're going to tweet any part. I was asked to to work on a project um, with a friend of mine, actually the uh, PI on a project that I'm uh, working on. Um, wanted to do a side project where we were looking at social networks of the food system in Wales, which is a, which is a very important topic. Um, I was as part of the project. I was helping with all of the quant stuff, doing the survey, and using the survey to uh, to build a web application that we could then unveil at a workshop of stakeholders. Um, and so you might understand I was quite nervous uh, at that and uh, worked really, really hard on it and built my, my first Shiny app that I was going to let other people look at. Up until that point, I built a few Shiny apps that would do sort of my own bidding that I needed done for a different task. Um, but this was my first uh, first kind of public showing, right? Um, and there was about 65 different stakeholders at the workshop. And during the feedback session, the idea was that you would you would go over the you would look at the shiny app, uh, you would look at a, a few other things, you would talk about it, and then um, you know we would gather some information and we'd have a feedback session. Anyway, somebody fed back and they said it's cool and all, but does it have to look like a 90s website? And I was devastated. It, it, it just it was like man, all of the work that we that it did to to build a the shiny app and um, to have it sort of unveiled and sort of 
the first thing that people see when they think about it is, you know, it looks like a website from the 1990s. Now, the reason that it looked like a website from the 1990s and not a shiny app is because I tried to make it look different from a out of the box shiny app and I didn't exactly know what I was doing. And I kind of ran out of time. Um, so I'm going to show you what it looks like. It's live and it's available. This is the cool bit. It's all interactive and it all does cool stuff and these people work together and there's a geographical map with pins on it that takes forever to pull up. But this is the part that they were talking about. Um, so this is the, this is just text, um, that you could copy over from a Word document and paste into a shiny, uh, a shiny, uh, script if, that you're, that you're using to build your shiny web application. Um, and, and it will show up. Um, it took me forever to get the, uh, uh, to get the spacing right and, um, and all of that. Uh, this page looks exactly the same. Um, so yeah, that was, that was what prompted this, this talk or this call to action. Oh, so I, I basically avowed then that I would never make another 90s looking shiny app unless it was on purpose. Um, so I did what any any self-respecting person would do. Uh, I bought a book and this is the book that I would recommend. There's a million um, out there, but this one is the one that I ended up buying for whatever reason. And it's a, and I would recommend it because it's a beautiful text. And I'll share the author um, is a guy named John Duckett uh, there. But this is this is a great text um, and, and would definitely recommend it. So I bought a book and I took a course on Udemy. The course on Udemy was pretty good, but actually the book is, is much better. And I learned about these two things called H and HTML and CSS. And so that's what I'm going to speak to you about the rest of the time today. Um, so HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language, um, and HTML uh, can basically, it is a markup language, and it can be slotted in directly, which means you can write HTML directly into uh, most RMDs, which is our markdown document, or an HTML document that you might create in R. So you've got a lot of different options to do. You can create, like, slidey um presentations you can create i'm going to mess up this word xenogren presentations which is what this is so this is an html output you're seeing here which is why you can see my google uh, uh my google browser there um but also your shiny web applications are going to be built um with html as well um and it's just it's just a markup language built to, to build websites with right um but sort of the the uh, the primary goal of HTML is to allow users to define specific um, text objects within uh, the text that they, they write and they want the user to read. Um, they can define different elements within that text, okay? Um, and the element can then be linked up with some other things and then be used to uh, manipulate or change the way that the text looks, okay? Um, so uh, there's uh, HTML has elements and uh, the elements have tags and you see an opening tag here, which is just a um, less than sign and then the element itself, and that could be like a paragraph or a header or something like that. And then a, uh, a, note, a greater than sign, and then the same thing um, with the closing tag here. So you write your opening tag and then your closing tag. Um, and then you actually write your text uh, between the two tag elements, okay? Um, you can inspect the elements um, within most browsers, I think, by right clicking and pressing something or perhaps doing uh, maybe an F12 or something like that. It depends on the browser, I think. But ultimately, you can you can kind of crack, o crack open these web pages and look at the uh, the HTML on the back side. Um, it's uh, mar our markdown is a form of markdown, um, just like HTML is. Um, and so you might have already been you might are already be familiar with our markdowns syntax and that is um where you use i guess it's a hash a hash mark for uh like a level one title uh, and then two hash marks for level two and three hash marks for level four um you sometimes can use a little 
uh, minus sign, uh, if you want to make a list or like a bulleted sort of item point, um, you can use asterisks before and after a word to make it italic um, or to make it to, to make it bold as well. These are kind of, you can sort of conceptualize these as being more simple forms of HTML. So R Markdown will then translate this syntax into sort of pure HTML. It's, it's, and this is how I understand it. So again, I, I'm still trying to understand this as much as possible. So if you know uh, the correct terminology of what's happening behind the scenes with our markdown, sure, do, do let me know. Um, um, but yeah, these are basically kind of simple forms of HTML. Uh, these are some of the more common HTML elements and something that our markdown will uh, take its syntax and then kind of translate that into. Um, but again, you've got uh, you've got the elements, uh, the opening tag and the closing tag, and then you've got the heading, um, a heading one between that, right? Um, so these tags kind of specify to the H1 tag, H1 there, a heading one level. So this would be kind of like a big heading document within your um, uh, within sort of your your web page or um, or text portion of a shiny app that you might be making. Uh, again, H2 for heading two, uh, P for paragraph, which is kind of like the normal text. Um, and then you do a list um, like this. Um, so you have to sort of open the tag um, with, I think that means UL for an ordered list, whereas an ordered list OL would be a numbering, excuse me, a numbering list, one, two, three, four. Um, and then you say list item coffee, list item tea, list item milk. And then you close the tag. If you've ever used LaTeX or LaTeX, it's it's very similar um, idea. You basically have to uh, you have to wrap all of your text in opening and closing tags and elements in order um, in order for it to be picked up and read by the by the document. So it's quite verbose, uh, verbose, but there's things that we will learn about in a bit that will will help with that process. Um, one of which is um, some great IDEs that are specifically available or specifically, not maybe not specifically, but can really help you write HTML um, that you can then paste into a R Markdown document or you can then paste into a Shiny app. That would be, um, I actually did rebuild this, this Shiny app and used a different uh, approach with an IDE, um, the Microsoft one, I forget what it's called. Um, but basically, it's it's very helpful in terms of uh, reminding you to close your tags and, you know, helping you with um, autocompletion and things like that uh, to sort of do this process much, much faster. So this is this is what it looks like um, in practice. OK, so you'll have an opening. Um, element of HTML and that kind of pronounces to the web browser that this is a document that it should be able to read. Um, here, uh, can y'all see my, supposing you can see my um, my mouse, um, but if you can't, between the HTML uh, element and the body element, you can specify a style sheet for CSSS, um, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but you can see I have uh, an uh, H1, uh, tag that says hello everyone and then a paragraph that says thanks so much for having me speak at Eden uh, should be BR um, and then a new paragraph that says I sure do wish we could meet in person it won't be long and this is Elliot by the way um, and then closing closing tag for the body um, and then a closing tag for the element and I should say you can you can write this really anywhere um, and save it as a .html document style with the extension .html um, and then open it up in a web browser and you've created a web page, you know? So it's not, it isn't that difficult to to get into, you know? Um, and so if you were starting this process, that's that's what I would recommend is that you, uh, you practice you using sort of a plain text editor or something like that. I mean, you could even use, you can use Microsoft Word, you know, just save it as a .html and then open it and it will be a web page. Um, now we're going to talk about CSS, which is uh, cascading style sheets.
So CSS is actually kind of maybe even the workhorse of styling your interactive uh, dashboards or your or your shiny apps. Um, this is kind of quote unquote where the magic happens. So um, with CSSS, we can create uh, unique rules for each HTML element, okay? Um, again, an element is an opening tag with the element um, name and then the closing tag with some text in between. Um, and here is a pro tip from um, the man, Mr. Duckett himself, says the key to understanding how CSS works is to imagine that there's an invisible box around every HTML element. And within that invisible box, you have an array of different ways that you can present, decorate, or, you know, um, customize uh, the text that's within that box. And the way that you do that or the styling that you choose to do that with is um, ultimately is how you're going to make your uh, interactive, you know, or outputs, um, how you're going to make them look like they're not necessarily straight out of the box, if that's your goal. So yeah, CSS basically creates um, rules associated with each HTML element, um, and it tells the browser exactly what to do to the text um, that you see between the two element pieces. Um, it contains two parts, a selector and a declaration. The um, selector indicates that the element, uh, indicates the element that the rules should be applied to. So it's sort of, this is the element that we want to apply this rule to, and it's, sort of like a signpost. And then the declaration indicates how that selector should be styled, i.e. this is where the magic happens. If you've ever done any web scraping, you might have used Hadley Wickham's tool, uh, the selector gadget. I use it quite a bit anytime, every time I need to do any sort of um, web scraping. Um, and I would hi highly recommend you, uh, you use it as well. It works really well with the RBEST package. Um, anyway, Selector gadget looks for CSSS selectors and, um, you know, HTML thing, elements and things like that. And so it will, uh, it will sort of go through the, um, HTML text of a website and identify different selectors that you, um, are interested in pulling data from. And then it will help you pull those out, uh, using the RBEST package. So that's where the name comes from. So here's a little, um, just a little schematic that I came up with to sort of explain how these two things work together. Um, and then I'm gonna show you uh, the actual code that we used here and how you can sort of implement this into your own projects. Um, and so you can see we've got uh, in blue here, well, we've got this HTML sort of um, text here or formatting here. Um, it says this font would be better in Arial, in Arial font, right? Um, and then I've got the opening tag P and the closing tag P for paragraph. Um, and so I create a, S a CSSS document. Um, actually, it doesn't have to be a document. It can be in the same HTML file, so you can store the two in the same file. Typically, I think the best workflow, if you're going to try to style an entire shiny output, would be to create its own uh, to create a, uh, a CSSS style sheet um, that's separate, and then you can link it to uh, to your R Markdown document, and I'll show you how how you can do that. Um, so yeah, you've got the selector here, P, and then uh, open curly brackets, and then font family colon Arial uh, semicolon, and then you can keep listing different things that you would like to do with whatever sits between these two elements, right? Um, and then it sort of when you run this or when you compile this, it then uh, changes this font would be better in Arial to actual Arial font. That's a CSSS mistake. That should say merge with R mark, R, dot RMD. And I'll show you how I made that in a second. <laughs> it's not on purpose, but I guess it proves a point, right? Um, so applying what we know. Uh, how do we get this information into our markdown or into a shiny app, right? Because that's typically how we're going to use or typically how we might make uh, an HTML or interactive output. Um, so again, sorry, the, the questions are rolling in uh, or, or there seems to be some chat. I don't know if it's directed at me, but I guess I guess you guys will let me know. 
Um, so yeah, HTML can be slotted direct, uh, directly in to most R Markdown documents. And I say most, but I think it's probably all, but I'm not sure. Uh, so I'm going to say most, but I would imagine that it would, it, since it's all sort of knitting to um, an HTML output that you can essentially, if it's going to HTML, you can put HTML in the document itself. Um, and then I believe that directly, when you directly put HTML into an R Markdown or to a Shiny app, it will then override any other syntax, um, R Markdown syntax or anything that you've included in there, right? Um, and then again, CSS can also, CSS can also be uh, included directly into most uh, .rmd files um, and Shiny apps, so you can just write it as text directly in, um, and it will interpret that when it when it knits or when it builds. Um, but I think the best thing to do is to create a style sheet for CSS, and then um, you can save that in the same directory, but then reference it or call it or link to it in the Shiny app itself. Then, of course, you can create themes. So that's how sort of themes are built, is that uh, for the most part, a theme is a lot of CSS with some HTML that makes um, makes Shiny documents or makes uh, R Markdown outputs look a certain way. So um, applying what we know, uh, I say, if this seems hard, if you've never seen this before, it's because it is hard. It's it's at, a, at kind of the lowest or maybe the highest level, it's it's how web development is done. Now, it isn't web development. Web development is, you know, it's m much more than that. It's JavaScript. It's all kinds of different things that's happening um, with websites. So I'm not, if you are a web developer, I'm not. I'm not saying that this is web development. I'm just saying that it's it's in that arena. And so if you're a data scientist or if you're, uh, you know, just an academic who uses R, it's difficult to then learn an entire new approach or, you know, coding language to, uh, programming language to, to be able to make your outputs look the way that you want them to look, you know? It's, it's, ggplot, you can basically code an R and make it look like anything you want to, but you've got to sort of step out of that, step out of R and, and into HTML and CSS. So yeah, I think it's perhaps it's a big a it's a big ask to um, to get people to uh, um, to learn CSS and learn HTML. Um, and luckily, I'm not the only one who thinks that. A lot of there's a lot of new packages out there that will uh, help our users get a handle on HTML and, and CSS. And it seems to be uh, a lot of information and a lot of what you would naturally kind of need if you ever found yourself doing a lot of this. Uh, it seems to be in development right now. Um, some of it is available and we'll talk about that. Some of it will be available in the next six months. Um, so it's a really exciting space uh, to get into interactive outputs with R. Again, putting it into practice, I'll show you why that word's not showing up. Um, so the first thing I will talk about, um, and I actually don't use this package very often, but it's HTML tools. And this is, um, I don't have any, this is the only R code that you're going to see in this presentation, um, except for I'll share I'll share the file that I used to build it. So this is, this is again, uh, this presentation was built in R Markdown. Um, and so you can see all the, the stuff that goes behind the scenes there. Um, but HTML tools, basically, I think what it, it what it's really what I use it for is if I forget tags. And um, so I use the tags function. But it's much more than the tags function, though. Um, and so you can build um, you can build entire sort of HTML documents um, in R without ever calling any HTML. You just use uh, this the tags function, which is basically tags is a list of all the different functions that you can you can use, all the different elements that you can use with tags that you can use um, uh, in HTML. And so it's a very good point of reference because you're going to forget what you call something and you're going to find yourself on Google looking it up way more than you should. And so this is a really great way to start. You can also go straight into um, creating uh, new classes and things like that, which is not something I know a lot about, so I'm not going to talk about it very much. But if you do, please feel free to, to point that out. Um, 
The next package that I wanted to talk about is uh, are, are basically theming packages. So there are there are a lot of um, uh, packages available to to add sort of they're kind of customized, um, but they're not actually custom. Well, you could customize them, but they are different themes um, than the traditional kind of shiny output that is blue or that is gray and blue. You know, um, shiny themes has um, several different themes that you can choose from. It has dark themes. It has uh, you know different colored themes and things like that. Um, that you just uh, five specify. Minutes, five minutes. Okay, all right, I'll be quick. Uh, that you just specify here. Um, and then you run it, and then it makes it look great. And then you can I, you can change this, but it's not it's not as easy thing to do. I I don't think. All right, I'm moving. Um, Zaranagrin is the package that I have started using to make uh, presentations that are interactive. This has no interactive bits to it, but we could add Plotly, we could add this network, we could add anything we wanted to. Um, I would I would look it up. There's good there's some good explanations online um, and play around with it. It has its own theme package, which I use to build here um, that I can show you with. It basically it it knows that it's difficult to style this stuff with CSS and with HTML, so it will it tries to interpret what the user wants and then allows you to make changes that are with sensible names that you would be able to to sort of say this is what I want like. Base color, this is the color for wheat four, and then it chooses all the other colors to go with it that would be complementary to wheat four. Um, and then let's say I want my base font size to be 25 px, um, and so it chooses that. And then you can pull in Google fonts as well, and it pulls those directly into your thing. Um, and this has probably got a hundred different functions in there that you can look up um, and change. This is what I just wanted to talk to you about really quickly, BS Lib. This is the kind of the new thing that they're developing out of R Studio, but it provides tools for using bootstrap themes um, and R. And it's got basically these great new functions where you can live, um, you can sort of, it, it creates a shiny app where you can um, go through and style different parts of your output and it will in real time change those. So you might drop down a color matrix of different colors and then you might do your mouse over it and choose a color that you want your your headers to be and then it will make your headers that color so it's basically probably the next evolution and how people are going to start styling uh, shiny outputs because it makes it so much more easy uh, easier for me though i would recommend learning some html learning some css it's just going to make things easier for you and it's it's not a difficult concept it's it's pretty easy but that's it for me um questions Thank you, Elliot. Thanks so much, Elliot. Then we have yeah. one. So there's a question from Mike. Uh, he asks, how do you manage the context switching between data science and front-end developer? How do I, how do I manage it? Um, not well. Um, <laughs> That's I wear the my same emotions. I <laughs> yeah. I wear my uh, emotions on my sleeve, so to speak. It's um, It's... It's uh, it's difficult, you know, it's uh, difficult because you'll build a shiny app and you'll say, this is an amazing thing that I've just, I built reactivity into this thing and it took forever and I thought out how to do it and it's beautiful and it looks like every other shiny app out there. And so you want to change it just a little bit, um, but you have no idea about like, a or I don't have any idea about aesthetics. Like my, this that thing that I showed you, I worked days just trying to get that blue uh, navigation bar is what that's called. Um, and then I went gray and blue and whatever, and I asked my wife, and I was like, what, am I, what, what color looks best? And it's like, I don't know. You're supposed to know that, you know, but you can't know that unless it's your job. So, yeah, I think I, I was going to talk to you about there's some color packages out there that might make it easier, but, yeah, I, the answer is not well. <laughs> If I can add yeah. on this, uh, there's uh, mo more than mo more than color packages. There's there's a few very useful websites that are particularly aimed at accessibility, uh, and they offer a few palettes that uh, work really well together already, and that are also um, aware of color deficiency uh, and um, other issues of the kind. So if you, if you are ever stuck in picking colors, there's plenty of wonderful palettes. Just just Google accessible palettes and you'll find them. 
And another, I, ha I have a question here. Um, so personally, um, I, I have been where you have now, but I don't think I will ever get out of the 90s feeling for my, <laughs> for my styling. Um, uh, personally, uh, given my um, academic, uh, academic background, uh, I have some experience in LaTeX, for example, that I might not have in CSS. Um, so uh, it is also possible to integrate in R Markdown styling uh, files that are written in LaTeX. So uh, CSS is not the only option there. So if oh. you struggle to learn something new, uh, you can always write that uh, the CSS style file as a tech file instead and just use whatever you would use as a preamble in a, in a, in a LaTeX document. I found that worked pretty well for me because I have used LaTeX for a lot of things over the years. Although it kind of defies the, 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 the sense of having a markdown language <laughs> Simplify things, but again, we are fine tuning here, so that I I believe that might be helpful. So you can you can include in your preamble a tech file rather than a CSS one for for the styling, as well as oh, using data in the document uh, exactly as uh, as you did uh, with with the HTML and the and the CSS. Great, thanks. So I have to I have to look at that. I'm not very good at at the LaTeX either. Um, well, then just speak the the lesser evil. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I I wouldn't I wouldn't suggest LaTeX to my worst enemy. But since uh, I, I I have been sort of exposed to it for so long, it, it comes easier than than maybe learning something new. So that might be helpful for for somebody. Right. Yeah. I use Overleaf, which is which is a handy thing yeah. if you don't know what you're doing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Great. Thanks for that. All right. Yeah. No problem. Okay, I'll I'll take a last call for last minute questions before we wrap up. All right. Well, in that case, I guess it just falls to me to say thanks very much to both our speakers this evening for giving up their time and coming along and showing us what they've been working on. So, thank you very much indeed. We have not yet uh, nailed down our speakers for next month, and we're always looking for more speakers. So if you are interested in giving a talk at Edinburgh, come and talk to us. You can find out how to get in touch with us or where to follow us to find out who is going to be speaking next month by heading over to the website, where you will then find all the remaining links to social media and so on. And with that, thank you very much and have a great evening.